what is the Hindu Sanatan Dharma actually mean? We are limiting the possibility of Sanatan Dharma by adding the word Hindu to it. Why uh, does does the supreme entity have a gender? Nobody told you Rama is a supreme entity. All of Ramayana unfolds because of Sita. Gender discrimination is not even an idea in our mind. When the Islamic invasions happened, they saw it so easy to take this country. Hundreds of women burning themselves to death. This is the most shameful dimension of our culture. We should not forget this. Namaskaram Sadhguru. We just wanted to ask a question about uh, Sanatana Dharma. Like, what is the Hindu Sanatana Dharma actually mean? See, there is no such thing as Hindu Sanatana Dharma. It is Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana means eternal. Something that's eternal means something that's always true. So, if you had come here hundred years ago, you would be dressed differently. You wouldn't be making a cinema, maybe you would be growing mangoes in Andhra Pradesh. Where are you from, Krishna district? Huh? That's Hyderabad, sir. Hyderabad <laughs> Maybe you will be a farmer, maybe you will be something else, a fisherman or something. Same man, but you would be doing something else. If you came thousand years ago, you would be doing something else. So what we are doing today, how you are dressed today, how you speak today, how you act today, is a generational thing, it's of the times. This keeps changing. How tomorrow the next generation will act, how they will dress, what they will do, it'll be totally different from the way we are doing it right now. So this is one dimension of life. This we call as smriti. Smriti literally translates as memory or from memory. Whatever you're doing right now, how you dress right now is either just like your father or in reaction, never like your father <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> but both by memory. So you have learned certain things by memory. This is smriti. But there is shruti, which can be interpreted in many different ways. One dimension of it is, it's the tune of life. This is not set by you, this is creation. Only if you understand the shruti of life, then you can find a rhythm. This is what Bharata means. Bha means bhava or the experience of life. Ra means raga, which is the shruti of life. Tha means tala. Bhava is what happens to you, it's an experience. But raga is already set, the shruti is already set. Now it's for you to find the right rhythm for that, so that life happens beautifully like a wonderful music. If you don't find the rhythm, the same Shruti which facilitates life will crush you. So, when we say Sanatana Dharma, we are talking about that dimension of life, which does not change, which is fundamental to our existence. Eternal. It's fundamental. It is the basis of our existence. Well, how you dress, what's your profession, how do you deal with your family, how do you deal with your relationships, society, this is all transient. Every generation it's different, from person to person it's different. But the laws that govern my life also govern your life and every other life, whether it's a worm, insect, bird, animal or plant, all of them are ruled by that law, which is Sanatana Dharma. The fundamental laws which govern the existence, this… this must be understood clearly. When we talk about laws, we are not talking about penal code imposed by human beings upon each other for control and whatever, some semblance of sanity in the society. Because that law has to change from generation to generation. You see, there is so much fight going on about change this law, change that law, every generation is fighting for it always. That's a different thing because that's a transactional law. When we talk about Sanatana Dharma, we are not talking about a transactional dharma. We are talking about an existential dharma. First of all, let us understand the word dharma. Dharma means the law. Dharma does not mean religion. In this culture, we don't know what is religion, we don't have such things. We are only looking at what are the underlying laws for my life to happen in the best possible way. Because we understand, unless you stick to the law, your life cannot happen well. 
Because a law is not an imposition, a law is the basis, it's the foundation of the existence. If you figure this out well, then your life happens effortlessly because you know the laws or you're in tune with the laws. If you don't know, for no reason you suffer, simply. So sanatana dharma is that dimension. Does it be belong to a Hindu or somebody else or an Indian person or some other person? That's not the point. This is what governs the existence. No culture has looked at it with such profoundness as we have in this culture. So because of that pride we may say, this is Hindu Sanatan Dharma, but we are limiting the possibility of Sanatan Dharma by adding the word Hindu to it. If you understand the word Hindu is a geographical identity, the land that lies between Himalayas and Hindu Sagara is Hindu, in that sense if you are saying it, it's all right for pride. But it's not all right, it's not correct, because Sanatana Dharma applies to every life, wherever they may be born or unborn. It applies even to unborn life and the life that is dead also. So Sanatana Dharma talks about how to handle the unborn, how to handle the born, how to handle the grown-up, how to handle different stages of life and how to handle the dead, all dimensions of life. But Smriti, is something that every generation should reinvent or uh, amendments need to happen. This only culture which has thought of things like this that we understand social transactions have to evolve. Evolution does not necessarily mean uh, we're doing something better than the previous generation. It is just that because situations are changing, we're evolving so that we fit into those situations. So situational transactions have always have to evolve and change. So this culture allowed that. How you ate hundred years ago, today we can debate and say that's not the way we want to eat because my work habits have changed. I, when I was plowing the land, I was eating that much of whatever. Today I'm just directing a movie, so I will only this much of this. So there is no law to say you have to eat like this, you have to fast like this, you have to do this. Because these are these laws must be constantly amended. As India's constitution can be amended ac according to the changes needed for a particular generation, similarly, but even in the constitution there are few fundamental rights and other things that you don't touch. You cannot call that Sanatan Dharma, but in a way it is. For the… for the nation, it is. There are few fundamental rights which are absolute, sacrosanct, you cannot touch it, but everything else is available for amendments and improvements and knockdown of certain laws, all these things. So, this is a very profound way of seeing life. But what has happened to us is, because of over a thousand years of invasion, and when they saw, when people who came from outside, what amazed them was, they did not come as conquerors to first, they just came as bandits, few dozens or a few hundreds, they were amazed how developed and how economically strong and so much wealth, but unprotected. Their idea of a heap of gold means, there would be ten men always standing there with arms, but here people put a heap of gold on the street and sold. Because society was so evolved, people understood what are the laws. If I steal yours, tomorrow you will steal mine and the whole society will collapse after some time. So people were so wise and evolved, when they came this looked like a free-for-all bonanza. They could take what they want. Wealth was not protected, women were not protected, they were everywhere. They picked up what they want and exploited it in a most horrible way, most horrific way. Today we are trying to glorify those things also unfortunately, but in a most horrific way did they, they did this. When the Islamic invasions happened, this happened. They did not come as invaders. They did not come as religious crusaders, they just came as bandits. But when they saw it was so easy, because there were men involved in profound music, mathematics, astro astronomy, astrology, all kinds of things, but there were not too many fighting men. So it was a walkover. The land, the beautiful land that this was, the rich banks of the rivers, agriculturally rich, wealth, gold, diamonds. The first nation which mined dim diamonds in the world is India, all right? The greatest diamond in the world is still from India, it is sitting on the British crown <laughs> But they saw this is like a 
paradise that you can take without resistance. And they took it because they were basically nomadic people, barbarian, they did their own terrible things. Even when the British came, we must understand, it is not the United Kingdom's army which came, it's East India Company which came. It's a business which came, but they saw it's so easy to take this country. They became emperors over a period of time. They came only to do business, traders. Traders came and became emperors and rulers of this nation because we had such a profound culture where people were not in that fighting mode, but involved profoundly into these things and laws were absolutely respected by everybody. So they thought the people who came from outside also was going to respect this, but they were in for a surprise. By the time they recovered, it was all over. <laughs> so now we are where we are, wherever we are, whether you are Indian, Hindu, non-Hindu, whatever you are, Sanatana Dharma applies to everybody because these are the laws which guide the fundamental process of life. But smritis are different. Your smriti and my smriti may be different. It is different actually. What is true in Andhra Pradesh is not true in Tamil Nadu, what is true in Tamil Nadu is not true in Kerala, so close by. What is true in this western Tamil Nadu is not true in southern Tamil Nadu. Because this is by memory, our parents, our culture, what they did, either we are doing the same thing or in reaction we are doing an opposite thing. But this is a constantly changing process, not only from generation to generation, in our own life, every few years our smritis are changing. From our memory we are changing, isn't it? Many aspects of our life. But Shruti doesn't change because this is not set by you, this is set by creation. So Sanatana Dharma means this, what governs your life, you must understand that. Once you understand that, you live a profound and beautiful life. So we didn't have to talk about… See, in this culture, nobody is talking about morality, commandments, what you should do, what you should not do, moral th stuff, if you do this, you will go to heaven, if you do that, you will go to hell, all this is not there. Because we inculcated this dimension, if you are in tune with the loss, you don't need punishment, you don't need reward. If you understand the traffic law uh, rules and you are driving accordingly, you don't need a policeman, isn't it? So this was a culture without a policeman for which we paid the price in some way, unfortunately. So Sadhguru, the… yeah, at that point of time, the Sanatana Dharma in our country was so strong. And uh, because it was our country, we call it the Hindu Sanatana Dharma. And Ippadiki uh, ee kalamlo, there is a talk that everything is diluted, like the… the be it religion, even if you think in terms of religion, in terms of the Sanatana Dharma of uh, today's age, Everything feels diluted, pulchpad poindan ok feeling on there. So, why do you think that is happening, even though it's been a long time since, uh, uh, since you know, we have, we have been under any direct foreign influence? And also, the original strength that we had, like back in the day, where did that come from? See, you cannot dilute Sanatan Dharma. Your understanding may be diluted. But dharma is not diluted because it's a basis of the existence. Society it, understanding. Yes. Individual understanding may be diluted. From person to person it may be in different dimensions of understanding. But is the dharma diluted? Who can dilute it because you didn't create it? That is what is governing the loss of nature, all right? So you cannot dilute it. When we say loss of nature, today modern science has brought this sense of very a uh, superficial way of looking at it. Loss of nature means gravity, physical things. But there is a law, see, from the same soil, this tree is growing. From the same soil, this creeper is growing. That comes out with one kind of leaf, this comes out with another kind of flower. From the same soil, you have eaten and you become this. From the same soil, I have eaten and I have become this. Source is same, look at the manifold expression. They say there are over… 1.6 trillion life forms on this planet right now, that's the thing. But I think there are many more that you've not even seen, okay? From a microorganism to a human being, in between everything has come from the same soil, isn't it? So, why is it? Suppose, let us say you and another animal eat the same food for the next two years. 
You think at any point you will get confused that you may be the animal or the animal will can get confused that it may be the director? Is it possible? No. no. So obviously there is a law governing it, isn't it? No matter what, it is not like a traffic lane where you can go here and there. It's like a railway track, it is just fixed and you're just going on it. The question is, how fast and how far will you go? That's the only question you have. You can't become this tree, can you? Can you become a tree? Can you become a dog? Can you become a cat? Can you become a cow or an elephant or a tiger? You cannot do what you want, you can call yourself a tiger. That's an evolutionary backward step <laughs> But you cannot become… if you eat like a tiger, you will not become a tiger. If you behave like one, you will not become one. Whatever you do, it will not become one because there is a fundamental law governing all this. If you understand and if you're in tune with that, you will live effortlessly. If you don't understand, every step you will struggle. So is Sanatan Dharm diluted? That's not even in our hands to dilute. Our business is only how profoundly do we perceive that law? How much are we in tune with it? So entire system of yoga is just that, we are not talking on those terms, but essentially we want to… we want you to be in tune with the rest of the existence so that your life happens joyfully, with exuberantly, to the fullest capacity that it can happen. See, only thing that can go wrong with your life is just this. Did you find full expression to your life or not? Isn't it? What can go wrong with this tree? Only thing is, will it grow into its full capacity or will it die as a half-grown tree? The same is true with the human being. If you are in tune with the loss, you will grow to your full possibility. If you are not, you will become stunted in some way. This is our only concern, isn't it? People may not actually think like this, but actually that is the only thing. All their desires, all their ambitions, all their longings are all about becoming a full-fledged life. So if you want to become a full-fledged life, understanding the laws of on what basis this life is happening, is it not very important? That is Sanatan Dharma. It doesn't belong to you or me. It is laid down by creation. It's for you and me to be in tune with it. Here. We have understood and codified it and put it together in a certain way. It doesn't mean in the rest of the world nobody knows about it. Many individual people know about it, they might not have written it down as Shruti, Smriti, whatever, all right? But a whole lot of human beings around the world have been in tune with it because everywhere human beings have blossomed and lived well. But no culture has put it together in an organized way because this level of understanding has not been there. This has happened to us because we had about six to eight thousand years of uninterrupted culture. This is why we call ourselves Hindu, because we know this uninter uninterrupted growth and flourishing of this culture happened because of two main geographical features. Himalayas protected us in the north, people didn't come easily. In the south, the Indian Ocean was the barrier. Once they learned how to cross Himalayas and once they learned how to navigate the Indian Ocean, then we are done. That's what has happened to us in the last thousand years. So, in, in today's age, sir, like today's uh, generation, whose responsibility would it be to teach or tell or guide people to be on the right path or to follow uh, or to understand uh, the dharma, because it's, uh, is, is it, I mean, in today's age, we have to even uh, wonder, is it, uh, is it even, does, does, who holds the responsibility, is it no, like… No, no, in every age, people think there is something wrong with the younger generation, okay? <laughs> there is a, there's a quote which says, uh, this younger generation, is lost, they have no respect for wisdom, they don't even stand up when elders come, this generation has no future. Something like this, I'm paraphrasing it, very much like that. But who said this? Socrates said it <laughs> 
at that time also he thought the same thing. So he now also parents are thinking the same thing. Our parents are also were thinking the same thing about us. <laughs> I am not thinking like that <laughs> about the younger generation. I see that there is a possibility. The question is the previous generation, what kind of footprint they leave, that de decides what kind of footprint the next generation will leave. If you have left an irresponsible footprint, ah, uh, they will go somewhere. If you have left a responsible footprint, responsible does not mean imposition. Responsible means cultivation, isn't it? Inspiration. Inspiration and cultivation, not uh, imposition. Okay, one question, sir. Chalamandi, Chalamandi, Adigaru, Bhakti TV, Taraf Kanchkoda. What is the difference between Guru and Sadguru and Adigaru? And what is the meaning? What is the meaning of the word Sadguru? And Mir Chatte. Sadguru means uneducated Guru. Guru may be highly educated. When I say education, see, people's idea of education is just memory, isn't it? We are trying to change this in this school, that it's not about your memory, it's about learning to use your faculty better, your mind, your emotion, your energy, you must learn to use it better, that is education for me. But largely education means, it's about enhancing memory. Anyway, in the next five, ten years you will feel stupid because right now my phone has six hundred GB. I'm sure you're no, nowhere close to that, all right? In another five years, this will have ten thousand GB. You will be no match. You may be a PhD out of your memory, but my phone will do ten PhDs in a day. Yes, not far away, it's going to happen. So those who are gloating on their memory, those who believe memory is intelligence, teachers, professors, scholars, I don't want to put guru in that thing, but you're mentioning in that sense, so all those people, because they read a book a few years ahead of you who think they are elevated, they're all going to fall with artificial intelligence. So a Sadhguru means he's uneducated. Uneducated means he has no memory of anything. He's Shruti, he's not Smriti. He's not by his memory, he's by his perception. So Sad means inner or inward. One who has grown from his within is a Sadhguru. When you say a guru, he could be of many kinds. Usually in this culture, we have very clearly defined like a Rishi, Raja Rishi, Brahma Rishi, a Yogi, a Siddha, Guru, Sadhguru, like this. These are all descriptions, these are not titles. People think they are titles. These are descriptions. Now I'm called Sadhguru so that you don't make the mistake of coming to me and asking, what about this Veda, what about that opposition? I don't know a damn thing <laughs> So just to make things clear for you, you are going to your Sadhguru. That means you don't ask him astrology, you don't ask him Veda, you don't ask him Upanishad, you don't ask him some scripture. If you want to ask something about life, because he's explored his life, from its origin to its ultimate. If you want to know something about life, he will talk. If you want to know something about scripture, you must go to that kind of a scholarly guru. So, in a way, <laughs> not to aggrandize myself, but in a way, if you have to say, a guru is like a mechanic. He's trying to fix a few things. He's not here to give you a great lecture on something. He's trying to fix you in a certain way. So if you want to… if you have a vehicle and you go to your mechanic, there are lots of local mechanics who can do many things. I must tell you my experience. There was a time I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle. Once again, I'm getting back on my motorcycle these days <laughs> So I'm just riding somewhere between Madhya Pradesh and Uttar, Uttar Pradesh, I don't know whether it's this state or that state. Whole night I've been riding early morning. Around 6.30, I come and uh, I park near a daba to have a tea or something. Motorcycles, uh, every two thousand, three thousand kilometers those days, these modern machines are better. You have to tighten the chain, chain becomes slack. I'm always carrying an extra chain because I'm on the road. You just have to 
delink one link, you have to take it off and put it, it's a small job. But it's messy, it's greasy, oily, your hands go bad, everything. So I parked for a tea in the morning, then I saw there was one mechanic shop right there, early morning, it was open, Mubarak Mechanical Works. I can't forget this, handwritten sign, Mubarak Mechanical Works. So I saw a young strapling youth, one Muslim boy. I called him, hey, can you fix the chain? I just want one link to go. He said, yes, I can do it. I said, okay, do it. So he brought his tools. I looked at him, he's got a hammer and a chisel. I said, what are you going to fix with that? He said, yes. I said, wait. And I walked into his garage, a small little shack. I look inside, all he's got is a hammer and chisel. With this he repairs everything. <laughs> I said, no, no, you're not going to touch my motorcycle <laughs> because I know if you do it with hammer and chisel, after that nobody else can do anything with the motorcycle, it's finished <laughs> I said, no, you don't do it, I got all the tools with me, <laughs> I will do it. Why I'm saying this is, like this, you read one book, it, as holy as the book may be. You read one book, you are a hammer and chisel mechanic, with that you try to fix everything. No, I have read nothing spiritual, because spiritual is the basis of your existence. Spiritual is not in the book. Only this life can be spiritual. A book cannot be spiritual, a teaching cannot be spiritual, something else cannot be spiritual. Only this life can be spiritual. So I just explored my life out of my own self-interest, because my life bothered me without any reason. We didn't grow up in that kind of a family where there's no food. There is food, there is a willing to educate you whichever way you want, everything they're willing to do, their best. But you simply… life is bothering you from inside. So I looked and looked and looked at myself, nobody else. I didn't put anybody else under microscope. I put myself under my own microscope and learn to look at myself because most people are incapable of looking at themselves. They're only capable of looking at others. So a Sadhguru is somebody who knows himself from its origin to its ultimate nature of this life. Fortunately, you're also made the same way on the level of Shruti. Fundamentally, you are also just made exactly like me. But in your transactions, you may be completely different from me, but it doesn't matter to me what kind of transactions you do in your life. It really doesn't matter to me. People are worried, Sadhguru, you can't be seen with this person, that… I said, there's no problem for me. Film director is okay for me, a criminal is okay for me, a prostitute is okay for me, anybody is okay for me, as long as they're human, it's okay for me. Because what is their transaction in the world is their business. My business is just to put them on the track of Sanatan Dharma, which is the basis of your existence. Whatever the hell you're doing in your life, my business is to see that you're a complete human being. First, activity is as the world allows, as the world compels sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes it allows, sometimes it compels. So activity is individual choice, I don't care what they're doing. Oh, how can you be seen with this man? This is a corrupt man, this is a politician, this is a prostitute. I have no issues with any of them because I am only looking at the life. I am not looking at their transactions. Their transactions is their problem. But every transaction they do, depending on the nature of the transactions, either they get something or they lose something. Something will happen, isn't it? <laughs> That's their problem. My problem is only to put this life on the fundamental tracks, which is the Sanatan Dharma, the eternal laws which ground… which rule this… govern this creation, you must be in tune with that. If you are in tune with that, do whatever you want. But does it mean to say everybody can do what they want? Tell me, if you become very blissful and wonderful, if you simply sit here, you don't have to make movies, you don't have to make money, you don't have to be famous, simply sit here and you're fantastic. Will you think how to rob these people, how to exploit that person, how to kill this person, will you think? Just… just imagine, you're feeling absolutely wonderful within yourself. Are you thinking how to get the best out of somebody? Will you? Just doesn't occur to you, isn't it? 
So the problem with the world is we are trying to fix the transactions without fixing the fundamental life process. When we say morality, ethic, values, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to fix the transactions without fixing the fundamental life. So if you fix this life the way it should be, transactions will happen according to the needs of the world. People are always asking, you know, <laughs> these kind of idiotic things uh, keep coming to me from journalists and others. Oh, in the olden times, yogis used to walk, you are driving your own car. I said, in the olden times, you idiot, everybody was walking, all right, not just a yogi. <laughs> yogi made a walk little faster than others. Now the yogi drives little faster than others, that's all <laughs> And uh, India, Mandesam lo muppai modu kotla devathal unnaru, there are thirty-three crore uh, gods uh, in, our, uh, in our religion that we follow. So, uh, so why, why is there a need for so many gods and how do we worship? And do you, do you believe in the fact that uh, uh, if if you when you worship that you just worship one one god or like you know each god has a specific way to be worshipped. We are Indians. We like variety. <laughs> we are not people who will stay in a uniform. We are uh, not one <laughs> like that. All right. See, first of all, change that question in terms of why does our religion has thirty three crore gods. Thirty-three crore, is it? Yeah, but our, the, why, do our, why does our religion have thirty-three crore gods? No, our religion doesn't have thirty-three crore, thirty-three crore gods. In fact, we don't have a religion. We are a land of seekers. We have variety of spiritual processes. Everybody can seek in their own way because the fundamental in the world, the fundamental of a religion means there must be a god, and you must believe this is the nature of the God, and you must believe this is the way to get to the God. This is… these are fundamentals. We don't have the God. The people whom you worship are all people who walked this geography at one time or the other. You are Shiva, you are Rama, you are Krishna, they walked this land at one time. They lived, they were… they had families, they had children, they fought battles, all right? And they are more drama than your life, yes or no? Much more drama than your life, much more turmoil than your life. But because of the way they live, the way they conducted their life, one thing is their full-fledged life, and no matter what kind of drama happened to them, they conducted themselves in an equanimous way, being above the drama. Because they were above the drama, we call them a director, I'm sorry, we call them <laughs> <laughs> we call them a divine being, all the others were in the drama, caught in the drama, but even though they're active participants in the drama, they stayed above the drama. In a way, people are claiming God is the director of life, isn't it? Hello? <laughs> and we're all the actors <laughs> <laughs> We don't know <laughs> about that <laughs> I'll leave that to you, but essentially, when we said thirty-three crore gods, we said that only when our population was thirty-three crore. Today, we have hundred and twenty-five crore gods. Actually, we should have, but we become little shy because of outside people making you feel like a fool. Oh, we have only one god, you all have a, you know, zoo full of gods. We're feeling shy, but no, this is a fantastic thing. One thing is we said thirty-three crore gods because we recognized every human being as a divine entity. This is why you go to the temple, what do you do? You do hi? What do you do? We pray. Yeah. You know what do you do? You do this. If you see a man in the street, what do you do? Do this. If you see a woman, what do you do? You do this. Even a cow, an animal, if you see a tree, a rock, if you see, what do you do? You do this. Because we recognized there is nothing here happening without the source of creation in some way functioning within that. So, we are trying to recognize that. When the population was thirty-three crores, we said we have thirty-three crore gods and goddesses. Today, it must be hundred and twenty-five crores. Not just hundred and twenty-five crores, it must be seven point six billion gods and goddesses. And why… why are we living out the other creatures? 
any number, trillions of gods and goddesses, because you recognize the source of creation is definitely throbbing in every leaf, in every fruit, in every root, in every insect, worm, animal, everything, including the human being. So this is what the culture is about. Today, somebody misinterprets the whole thing, saying, oh, you have thirty-three gods, actually there's only one god. How the hell do you know there's only one god? You just believe it, right? But here, we were given the choice to make our own gods. Do you understand? There's something called as Ishta Devata, that you can choose the god you want. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. You, god is not an imposition on you. You can make this tree your god and every day worship this god. In your garden, if you go and worship your tree, in India, neighbors will not think you're crazy. If you do it in any other country, they'll call the police. Do you know this? I'm not joking. They'll call the police. They will attack you. In some countries, they will attack you. In some countries, they'll call the police. But you go into your garden, there's one rock standing there, one little stone, you go and worship, oh, people will say, oh, he's a devotee. So, is it not important? The important thing is to see the footprint of the divine in every piece of life around you. Right now, because God has been exported to heaven, you can do all the trash here and misinform him about your actions <laughs> and then you will go to heaven anyway. Here we are not interested in going to heaven. We know even if we go and sit on God's lap, after a few days we'll be bored with him. We are smart enough to know that, hello? <laughs> Is it not true? Access. People whom you thought are the most fantastic human beings, when you be with them for three days, you go, you're bored, you want to go to a cinema, <laughs> leaving that person there. <laughs> So even with God, the same thing will happen, even with heaven, the same thing will happen, we know this. Because of this, our highest value became freedom or liberation. The only goal in this culture is mukti, moksha, nirvana. This means you want to become free, because freedom is the ultimate process of life. God is not the ultimate process here. We… we can create any number of gods, we have no issues. If you need some kind of a… Support. Above all, these gods were created in a certain way. Some of them may be just an emotional expression of people, but a whole lot of them have a scientific basis to it. To access different dimensions of life, we created different kinds of deities. See, a murti… I don't know in Andhra Pradesh if you are still using this word. In Tamil Nadu still, many people call the murti as a yantra. Is it still there in Andhra? Not that I heard of, no. If you see in temples, there will be drawing, you know, geometrical drawings to yeah. Yeah. make the deity into yantra. Yantra means what? A machine. A machine. Why do you create a machine? Because right, right now, why do we… Ha why are we using a microphone? To do something. Because to enhance the faculty that we already have. We are able to speak. Suppose we had no speech, would we invent a microphone? Suppose you were made like a tree rooted to one place, would you invent a bicycle? No. Every machine that we have created is only enhancement of our existing faculties, isn't it? So the deities were also yantras, that means they were machines, which will enhance your capability. Well, it is… my life is a living uh, demonstration of that. But, uh, you know, if anything in India is a suspect today, for Indians at least. Everybody else looks at us in such great uh, awe. But in India, anything Indian is this thing because uh, there's a whole segment of media who is committed to beating this nation down. Yes, they're committed for beating this nation down for whatever reasons, I don't want to go into the reasons. But they're doing it continuously. But. If it happens elsewhere, for example, you heard of Ramanujam, the mathematician. If he had not gone to London, we would have told him, we would have declared here he's a useless guy, all right? He just poured out mathematics, no training, no schooling, nothing. Simply mathematics just poured out. What mathematics means is, it's another expression of creation. Creation reduced to numbers so that we can understand in a certain way, that's what mathematics is in a way. 
And this entire mathematical process, Albert Einstein said this, this entire mathematical process which is the basis and the backbone of modern science would be nothing without contribution from India. One important f uh, fragment of this is zero. Nobody could have thought about a zero except this nation because only here we are looking at nirvan, moksha, which means becoming nothing. Nothingness is our ideal. So zero is always a big factor in our life. The ultimate nature of existence is nothingness. Today modern science is saying over ninety-nine percent of creation is nothing, all right? That's a dimension. But nobody would have observed it outside. Only because we turned inside, here we said, this is it. Not only that, he poured out mathematics simply. When he was sick and dying, the last few months or whatever, he was simply pouring books and books of mathematics, simply writing. Some of the mathematics, some of the formulas and equations that he did actually describes black holes. See, there was no concept of black hole in 1910 or 1908, 1908 when he was writing this. Without a concept and a theory, you can't make math in science. But he first made math. Many years later, almost forty years later, they came up with the idea of a black hole, a concept of a black hole. But he already made the math. When people asked him, where is this coming from? He said, my Devi bleeds mathematics. For him, his Devi is the window to something possible. So similarly, deities were created as a possibility to enhance your faculties in a certain way. So for everybody, we created a deity. You are a businessman, you want to become rich, one kind of deity. You are a creative person, you want to be creative, another kind of deity. You are a spiritual person, another kind of deity. You are a thief, for him also we have a deity, you know. Thieves have their own goddesses and gods who support their thievery. Yes, it is so. If you see uh, traditional, uh, you know, there have been tribes who are uh, culturally thieves, they're very proud of their uh, profession. You know, you have heard of the Pindaris and the Pindaris, others. Yeah, yeah. All these people had their own deities. Without worshipping their deity, they never went on their thievery business because they saw it as a trade. And for… to support that kind of activity, they had their own deities because these are energy forms which were created to facilitate a specific type of activity. So you want to be intellectually brilliant, one kind of deity. You want to be emotionally rich, another kind of deity. For everything we created a deity. These are yantras, these are machines. So if there is a machine, you must know how to use it. If you don't know how to use it, you think it's junk? That's all that's happened today. Nobody knows how to use it. That is because most of the temples are taken by the government. Government clerks are there, no devotee, no devotee in the temple. Government clerk is running the temple. Some of the police officers in Tamil Nadu are saying, in the media they have said this, that anywhere between thirty to forty percent of the main deities in the temples may be sold and fake deities are sitting there. They're saying that, I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. There's some jewelry that's missing, it comes in the paper. Jewelry is gone, land is gone. First of all, devotee is gone. A temple without a devotee means we know your intention is to run it down because you did not understand the profoundness of the culture. You thought this is just like one more religion. This is not religion. This is exploration of human possibility. Sadhguru, there's a... Uh... At, at creation, there is supposed to be uh, Shiva, Brahma and Vishnu and uh, it could be uh, uh, personalities, it could be energy and then there's also a story of how there are avatars who save the earth, the Das avatars. And uh, all of these, all of these characters are men, essentially. Is, uh, is, it, is, it, is it that for a reason? Does, uh, does if, if that idea of a god have a gender? So you're missing the point. There are a whole lot of people in Andhra Pradesh whose name… name is Sita Rama, Radha Krishna, yes or no? Yes. Why are they putting the woman first and then the man? It should be Krishna Radha, but nobody says that in this culture, we say Radha Krishna. 
Radha is not even his wife. Yeah. She entered… she entered his life at the age of eight, she exited at the age of sixteen. The major part of his life, she was nowhere there, all right? She… Ne he never went back and saw her because he got engaged with something else, he migrated, all those things happened to him. But still we say Radha Krishna, not Krishna Radha, we say Sita Rama. What more do you want? No, I… more of… more on the terms of… Uh... No, leave… leave the… see, at least here, women existed. You do one thing, you read regular world history, which is generally all about wars and conquests and this and that. Is there any woman there except to service them sexually around? There were some, you know, women who were carried with the armies. Apart from that, was there any significant woman there playing an important role? No, not. Yes, because the recording of history, unfortunately, is done like this. If you see Ramayana or Mahabharat, women have significant role in the drama. In fact, whole of Mahabharat unfolds because of a woman. Whole of Ramayana unfolds because of Sita, isn't it? It's all about Sita. The wars are about Sita. In Mahabharat, all the wars are about Draupadi, isn't it? So, how can you say they don't have a significant role? When it come to battles, of course, men dominated the battle scene and it should be so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Look, I wasn't uh, saying about the significance, I was saying about like, why uh, does… does the supreme entity have a gender? See, nobody told you Rama is a supreme entity. Or Vishnu. No. Nobody told you he is a supreme entity, isn't it? Did anybody tell you? It's only from what we've heard. No, even what you have heard, please look at it and see. A certain manifestation, yes. Well, when Rama and Krishna, Krishna especially and Rama also, particularly Krishna, he never started a day without worshipping Shiva. If he's the supreme entity, he wouldn't be doing that. Shiva has always been seen as a yogi, not as a god. That's why here we're calling him Adiyogi because he's the first yogi. Tell me, have you seen any picture where he's not sitting like a yogi? Either he's a hunter or he's a yogi, isn't it? So everywhere, tell me any god in the world, do they have a wife, two children and pets all around? Children's pets and his own pet, everything all around. Have you seen a god like this? All of them have significance, isn't it? Nandi sits before Shiva, he is more dominant. Parvati always there next to him. So, this gender discrimination is not even an idea in our mind, you understand? It doesn't exist for us. It is just all this hodgepodge is of more recent origin. And putting the woman behind in the door… behind the doors, all happened after invasions came. Because when invaders come, the first thing they want to lay their hands upon is your wife and your daughter. Horrible things will happen to them. So we started hiding them because day after day they're coming, you don't want the woman to be seen outside because somebody will grab them and take them away, terrible things will happen. You heard recently those movies came, uh, you know, Padmavat and whatever. All this is telling you what people are trying to glorify the burning of the woman. It's a horrible shame that we could not protect them. Why are they burning themselves? You think they want to go to heaven? They just want to avoid the hell of being captured because they know what will happen to them. It's better to die. Dying by fire is better than getting into the hands of certain people. We must understand this in the right context. Why hundreds of women burning themselves to death or jumping into wells, they are saying when invasions happened, the wells got full with women. You understand, the bodies. It filled up the well, there was no place to jump. The whole village or town will go and jump into that deep well. Why? Because what they were doing to the woman when they won the war was so terrible that it was best to die. So we should not attach any glory to it or pride to it. This is the most shameful dimension of our culture that we have been taken like this 
our women have been put through this, all kinds of things have happened to us, we should not forget this, not to become bitter about somebody, but to see that things don't happen to us or to anybody in this world, that's important. Yes. So last two questions, sir. Uh, can you describe bhakti? Can you define what bhakti means? <laughs> bhakti means... Uh, the English word is uh, more... See, the way of we have seen bhakti is... It's a way of directing our bhava. You have all kinds of bhavas coming. When you are a child, uh, maybe if you saw a puppy, your bhava went behind the puppy. If you saw a bicycle, it went behind that, that bicycle meant more than your parents? Yes or no? At, at a certain moment, I'm saying, you saw a dog, the dog means more than your mother? At a given moment, maybe it'll change after some time, but at that moment when you want to play with the dog, tch, your bhava becomes like that. Whichever way or wherever your bhava gets directed, slowly that will become your quality. So you become a young man, in the neighborhood, there's a young girl, your bhava becomes about her. But after ten years, you wonder, why the hell? <laughs> I'm saying, your bhava keeps changing, which leaves your being in a confused state. So, bhakti means to organize your bhava in such a way that for a life, you can hold it in one direction, so that your growth is not like this. You don't have a million years to go like this. You have to go like this. This is why bhakti, bhava has been organized into one thing. So what is that one thing? Suppose right now, let's say you are my son or my brother or something and I put my bhava into you, tomorrow you do something that I don't like. Now I want to put my bhava somewhere but there is nobody here, <laughs> all right? <laughs> then I'm broken because my bhava is disturbed. Once your bhava is disturbed, you suffer immensely. So you put your bhava behind that kind of entity with which you have no argument. It's a divine entity, no argument, no expectation, but you know your bhava is organized. Once your bhava is organized, you are going in a straight line. That means you will travel far in this life. The English word devotion is also very beautiful. Devotion means the root word for this is dissolution. So devotion is a tool for you to dissolve yourself. It is not a tool to ask for this, ask for that. Dear God, give me this, give me that, protect me, save me, is not devotion, this is a transaction. It's a cheap transaction, if you ask me. Because <laughs> the transaction is like this, God, I will give you ten rupees, give me ten crores. Is anybody in Hyderabad willing to give you ten crores for ten rupees? He'll slap you in the face. Any man, sensible man, isn't it? But God is so stupid that ten rupees, ten crore deal he'll do with you. So, bhakti or devotion is not a transaction. It is a way of organizing yourself in such a way that you are never in your way. There are many other impediments in life which we need to handle, but you should never be in your own way. There are thousand issues in our life but you should not be that issue, isn't it? You must be a source of solution. You are not a source of problem to your life. Maybe somebody else thinks you're a problem, that's a different matter. But you are not a problem in your life. But please look at other people's life today, lives today. With so much education, intellect, everything, they are the only problem in their life. They don't need any outside help. Sitting, standing, they will drive themselves nuts. For this, they have all kinds of exotic names. This is stress, this is tension, this is anxiety, this is depression, this is this, that. Essentially, you have become an issue in your own life. Essentially because you are not able to handle your own faculties. If you took away half your brain, you will be peaceful. Your own intelligence you are not able to handle because there is no bhakti. When I say bhakti, don't think bhakti means only going to the temple, doing puja, doing this, no. Tell me, anybody in any field of life, whether sport, spirituality, uh, art, music, business, anything, has anybody done something truly significant in this world without being devoted to what they're doing? 
Have they? No, sir. Without devotion, nobody has crossed limits, isn't it? Mediocre things, they might have earned a living, but nobody has done anything significant without being absolutely devoted to what they're doing. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, how is this? So many things in all these years, all kinds of things, all right? Not one kind, every kind of thing. But neither do we suffer, nor do we give up what we're doing. <laughs> because we are absolutely in a state of bhakti with what we're doing. People ask me, are you a devotee of Shiva? Somebody was asking me in one of the meetings, I said, you idiot, how many times did you see me sitting and doing Shiva puja? Have you seen me? You never seen me. What am I doing all my life? I am devoted to you, that's what you don't understand. My entire life is devoted to you, but you think I am devoted to something else. This is all the problem is with life, because if your bhava is not organized, your life will go all over the place. It will not go in a straight line. So bhakti is very, very important, but do not understand bhakti as something that you do only in a temple or some place. This is why we brought up this culture like this. If you see a tree like this, if you see the food that we eat like this, man like this, woman like this, child like this, animal like this, whatever we see, bhakti. Because the bhakti is not about that, bhakti is about my bhava being organized. And how is bhakti related to spirituality? Tell me, I already said this, no matter what is the area of life, if there is no bhakti, you will not go far, that's all. Do not understand bhakti as chanting mantra or doing puja, no. It is just that your bhava is… Your, you want to dissolve into your object of dissolution. That means, what what you are directed towards is more important than yourself, that's all, that's bhakti. Sadhguru, uh, it's been twenty-eight years uh, since Isha has uh, mm -hmm. started and uh, it's uh, not just in India but uh, across the world, how was it twenty-eight years ago? How did it start? <laughs> so twenty-eight years is uh, the yoga center. Sir. Yes. This activity is on for thirty-seven years now, but largely till ninety-eight, ninety-nine or two thousand, till two thousand, we were only focused on one goal, Dhyanalinga. So really our worldwide activity is only from two thousand one till now, so it's actually eighteen years of activity. Well. Today, uh, people estimate that we've touched over five hundred million people, that's half a billion people. But thirty-seven years ago, when this phenomenal experience happened to me on the Chamundi Hills, I sat there and simply, if I sit there, I'm… I'm like dripping ecstasy in every cell in my body. I again and again tried the next few days and weeks that I do activity something and if I simply sit, it just… I'm just bursting with ecstasy. That time I thought <laughs> that this is so simple. If you don't do anything, if you don't mess with yourself, you will be ecstatic. Ecstatic means bursting with ecstasy. At the peak of your life, if only you don't mess with your psychological stuff, then I thought, this is so simple, I will make the whole world ecstatic <laughs> Well, at that moment, I thought this is the first time I have discovered this. Because I had no traditional background, I had no spiritual background, I just grew up in a very westernized way. And this was bursting within me, I thought, at that is the time, where, uh, you know, youth of that… that generation were so much into drugs, seeking experiences. But here I was, if I just close my eyes, I'm in the highest possible experience that a human being can be. So I thought no drug, no God, no religion, no nothing, no philosophy, if you don't mess with yourself, you're ecstatic. 
I thought this is very simple. On that day, world's population was 5.6 billion people. I thought, I made a plan. In two and a half years' time, I'll make the whole world ecstatic <laughs> Thirty-eight years <laughs> People think we are a great success because we have touched half a billion people. I don't think so, because for me, humanity means 7.6 billion people. Well, I might die a failure <laughs> but a blissful failure. This is something all the young people must understand. You must… Uh, you must choose to fail because the goals that you choose are so huge, in one lifetime you cannot do it. You set up petty goals, you finish that and you think you're a great success. What is the point of such a life? You aspire for something which cannot be fulfilled by one generation of people, but you have the privilege of setting the direction for that. You will die of failure, but it's a very blissful failure <laughs> So, as far as I'm concerned, I am a failure, it's a foundation is a failure. It doesn't matter, all of us work nearly twenty hours a day, seven days of the week, but all the time, we know we are short of what we can do or what we should be doing. This is what drives everybody here. All the young people who are here, they have no usual pleasures of life, what others are seeking in cities and all. The only pleasure they have is they are working for a large vision and they see the transformation in people's faces, how they come and how they leave. You must see, you should have recorded people, how they come, on day one to a program of three days, when they leave, they're bursting with ecstasy. So like this, millions of people seeing their faces and seeing the transformation that is being brought about, that is the only thing which keeps them going. And their own transformation al also, of course. So, these thirty-seven years, though in my view it's a failure, the world thinks we are a great success <laughs> because they think small. <laughs> so, sir, that means uh, in normally everyone adutar sir is an organization ki uh, what is what is the future plan? What is your ten year plan? So, Miku, mm -hmm. thirty seven years Mundanunchi, you had only one. Plan. Only one plan, still working for the same plan. Ten years later, thirty seven years later is also the same plan. It's to touch. Uh, uh, Population is increasing, so we'll always be failing, falling short <laughs> And there are also… there are many people who are committed to be miserable, it's hard to change them <laughs> In so many ways, whatever may be happening in their life, they've chosen to be miserable. If they're poor, they're misery, miserable about their poverty, you make them rich, they're miserable about the taxes, you are not educated, you're miserable about that. Put them to school, endless misery. Not married, they're miserable about it. Get them married, <laughs> don't ask me <laughs> So, people are committed to be miserable, to make them willing that you can be exuberant and ecstatic because human experience is caused from within. External arrangements we make sometimes, outside arrangements work for us, sometimes they don't work for us. But human experience happens from within you. This must happen your way, isn't it? The world will never happen hundred percent your way. To some extent it'll work for us, the world. It'll never happen totally my way or your way, isn't it? Yeah. So… Even your cinema doesn't happen hundred percent your way. We don't know, sir, <laughs> what will happen when it… <laughs> That's what I'm saying, you may be a director, but still everything doesn't happen your way. As in we just give it our best and that's… That's, uh, it. <laughs> that's That's all we can do. No, with the outside world, that's all you can do. But what's happening within you must happen your way, isn't it? If it happened your way, I'm hundred percent sure you will choose blissfulness, not misery. That's all we're working for, it's simple goal. But to make people understand it's so simple, that's taking time.
<laughs> thank you, Sadhguru. It is uh, it has been a pleasure, and it's been thank you for spending so much time with us. All the best for you. Thank you. <laughs>